Welcome to Hedge Interview. I'm your host, Jennifer Bruno, and this episode of Hedge Interview is part of the Manager Profile series, which is designed to provide valuable face-to-face -face introductions to exceptional asset managers. I hope you'll find this interview to be useful and interesting. Thanks for watching. I'm speaking with Piyush Sharma an investment manager at Right Horizons Minerva Funds. Piyush currently manages the India Underserved Fund, which he started in 2011. Right Horizons is an asset manager based in Bangalore, India, and it manages, this firm manages approximately 150 million. In terms of Piyush's experience, he started, before he started his India investing journey, Piyush covered equities in various sectors, including business services, autos, consumer products, and financials. He has worked for investment managers, including Sanford Bernstein, Longbow Research, and Avondale Partners. The teams he's worked for have been recognized by leading institutional research organizations, including Institutional Investor and Greenwich Associates. Hi, Piyush. Welcome to the show. I'm thrilled to have you today. I'm excited for you to tell us about your firm's expertise and your investment strategy. So let's get started with my first question, which is really um, not so much a question, but for you to tell us about your, your firm's expertise and, and your experience. Um, so we are an India-focused long-only fund. Uh, we manage uh, across both offshore and onshore structures. Our offshore structure, incidentally, is domiciled out of Mauritius. Onshore is out of Bangalore, India. The team is entirely India-based. Um, in terms of how we started this journey, how the concept was created, just to give you an idea, um, I started funneling into the Indian small cap universe sometime in 2009. Why India and why small cap, if you would ask? India primarily, I mean, not so much because of because we were Indians, we were, we were born in India, a lot of our experience was in India, but really because globally, when you look at allocators looking at a very assorted set of emerging market universe, they tend to bucket all of that within one basket, even though there's hardly much in common. India in particular stands out versus almost the entire emerging markets primarily because it's much broader. When I say much broader, just to give you a context, India overall today is about $2.2 trillion market. The biggest 100 companies would, would, would be about a trillion and a half. That leaves you with about 700 billion of broader universe to look at. Uh, just to give a perspective, Taiwan, for instance, is overall about a trillion dollar market. And, that's, and we are talking about a market that overall is a higher weightage within MSCI than, uh, than even India. Um, and India is not top heavy. If you were to look, compare versus other markets that are in line uh, in terms of weightages or higher, look at China or Korea, top 10 securities in China and Korea would account for almost 35% of total market cap. You would look at markets like South Africa, could be 50%. Brazil is even worse at almost 60%. 75%, three-fourths of the entire market cap of India really lies across the top 10 securities. So this isn't a market that's Alibaba, Tencent, and then everything else. This is a market that's, that's, that's much more broad. Um, why small cap? When we started looking at exposures that allocators here are, have within EMs, uh, certain things just literally stood out. I mean, if you were investing within South Africa, one would ask, aren't you really just taking exposure to Naspers and Sab Miller versus capturing South African idiosyncrasies? One might argue the same thing when you're investing in Cosby 50. Where are you investing? You're investing in Samsung Electronics or LG or Hyundai, not really capturing Korea. Uh, similarly, investing within Tata Motors and you think you're investing uh, within India or capturing the idea, Indian idiosyncrasies, that's just not true. Uh, so which is the reason why we were looking at small cap in general. Uh, so when we looked at the Indian small cap, broad, broader mid cap and small cap space, certain things stood out. Low institutional ownership, low institutional coverage. Now, mind you, this comes within a market where we are talking about Nifty 50, the most well covered uh, large cap benchmark constituents in the world. An average Nifty 50 component today would have north of 50 sell side opinions per name. 
that makes them comfortably the most well-covered benchmark in the world. And within that same country, I'm talking about a $700 billion universe, uh, often you'll come across 100, 120, 200, 300 million dollar companies going uncovered, sparsely covered, not really attracting the sort of institutional coverage that they can. Uh, part of that is because of the lower floats that they have. Regardless, that's where most of the opportunity lies. Now, in, incidentally, this universe also comes with an irritant, which is heightened volatility. So we started thinking, is there any way that we can create a strategy without the associated volatility? So we started putting in some basic forensic levers and we came up with the resulting set and we said, now let's see that over one year plus periods, over any meaningful period of time really, do earnings and stock prices track each other? And we were surprised, not really surprised, but it was such a material divergence that this resulting set didn't gyrate as wildly as the rest of this small cap universe did. Then we started overlaying some more things on it. So for instance, we started intentionally avoiding headline benchmark constituents within small caps and mid caps. That ensured that we don't go in sync with liquidity cycles. Over a period of time, we laid some more manual forensic levers on it and started looking more in terms of absolute valuations than optical headline multiples. That disconnected us a little bit more from peers and from indices. And we've been at it for eight years. We've delivered 14% annualized return over a period when small caps have delivered about 7% half of that. More importantly, in a long only strategy at volatility levels, that's not only incomparable versus the broader small cap universe, but it's less than that of even Nifty 50, which is India's large cap universe. So, yeah. So you've defined a, a niche that is um, maybe an underserved, is that why you call it India underserved? Uh, well, India underserved, the name came up because a vast majority of the constituents fall within categories where the category expands at least in linear fashion with income growth. So if you'll expect household incomes to grow, let's say fivefold over a period of time, you, you, you would expect those categories to grow north of fivefold at least. And a lot of these names fall within such categories. And of course, a lot of other things uh, go into play too. You're obviously looking at names that can retain the sort of pricing power that, that we would like. How would you define your investment philosophy or what drives your decision-making primarily, if you had to summarize that? So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's funny that when you talk to allocators, they'll typically put you somewhere within value and growth or a scale somewhere within. Uh, from my experience, at least within India, I can tell you, I've looked at names trading at single digit multiples that are the priciest names I've ever seen. I've looked at names north of 30 times, which are among the most attractive names that I've ever seen. Uh, so when we look at names in India, if we would now, sustainable growth and value are very, very important for us. But we do, don't define value in very conventional terms. We look at absolute valuations. Also becomes very critical when you're looking at markets like India because vast majority of Indian companies really listed within the last 10 to 12 years. So one, you don't have enough trading history. Wherever you have enough trading history, a lot of that trading history gets skewed by scarcity premiums. A lot of new industries are getting created. So you can't really look at historical multiples, look at current multiples and have any sort of explanatory power when you're coming with any conclusion based on those kind of data points. So you, you really need to need to dig deep, look, uh, look more in terms of cash based absolute valuations. Um, and that's what we do. When we really scan the universe and drill in deeper, certain things become very important to us. For instance, uh, we're trying to identify opportunities that can deliver north of 20% earnings growth for at least the next three years, if not the next decade. Ideally, these situations should come up at valuation levels where the odds of multiple contraction are very, very limited, if that. And if that is the case, then we can consider such names, obviously, um, uh, depending on what else is available out there. Third and very, very important thing for us is uh, forensics. And I, I'll say we spend more time on forensics than most people do. Um, and it's very important for us that these names are clean. Uh, so while we have identified a very secular long runway of growth ahead of us, we've identified that at valuation levels we are comfortable with. 
nonetheless, all of that comes to naught if these names are not clean. And so accounting clarity becomes very, very important to us. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of a decision making on the exit side, uh, I would say one or two of both things uh, need to happen in sync for us to consider an exit. So either our hypothesis is completely played out uh, or the valuation is running at levels that are materially ahead of our conservative uh, estimates of absolute value. And, it, uh, and you know, it, typically when that happens, uh, uh, we, we seriously consider exiting. But, 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 we, but we are not the sort of investors that go in and out. In fact, if you look at our, our, our turnover rates, uh, they, they, they're really more in sync with uh, what strategic investors have rather than listed market investors would have. Okay. And so you're not the only India uh, fund or India investment uh, program. So how would you differentiate your program from the majority of others? What do you think is a, a differentiating factor? I would say... Absolutely. Uh, in, 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 in terms of our forensic work, uh, I would say that we, we, we seriously differentiate ourselves with just about everybody else. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident we spend much more time on them than most people do. Uh, now, b- b- before I explain that, uh, let me give you a brief idea of the universe that we operate within. Right? Now, when you're looking at India, you've got two broad challenges within the listed universe. First, you have to identify businesses with clean financials. Secondly, you have to ensure that wherever you have identified businesses with clean financials, these are names where capital isn't being siphoned off through other structures. So even though you've identified the core operating cash flows that are getting generated, the fact is you may or may not capture that. So you have to ensure that minority shareholders do capture that. That's two. Um, so specifically, when you're looking at India, um, as per Indian Gap today, when it comes to related party transactions between subsidiaries, and that's often used to, to siphon capital off. So yeah, we, we do have requirements that require you to, um, to report certain transactions as material. So if it's more than 10% of an annualized run rate on any line between two entities, uh, which are related parties, that's a material related party transaction. However, there are ways to short circuit that. One, you can create X number of related parties to ensure that you don't breach that. Two, you have to consider how many of such transactions are you even require shareholder approval. So unless there's any transaction that's more than a fourth of annualized run rate, you don't even need to go to shareholders. A transaction between a parent and a wholly owned subsidiary doesn't require shareholder approval at all. So that's the that's market we operate in, and therefore you need to look at structures very, very closely. Mm-hmm. You need to look at several other facets. I mean, just um, at the top of my head, stuff like uh, um, um, auditor compensation. Now, now we've noticed whenever, uh, and this is very interesting, that whenever in India, uh, a, an auditor has given a qualified opinion on a BSE 500 company, there's close to 50% chance that the auditor is shown the door within the next three years. Wow. Yeah. So you, you need to be very, very mindful of these things. Mm-hmm. Now, we, we, we realize that any time a big material restatement happens, audit fee will increase in a 10 to 20% range. But if you're getting paid substantially above average and without any material restatement, uh, these are things that you need to look at very, very closely. Mm -hmm. So if you were to look at my book over the past eight years, a few things I would say will always stand out. You wouldn't see companies with tons of um, uh, subsidiaries within the same tax jurisdiction. You wouldn't see subsidiaries collectively bleeding cash. You wouldn't see creeping acquisitions by promoters of subsidiaries uh, at very, very crazy valuations. Uh, You would see... Uh, operating cash flows and operating earnings over any meaningful period, tracking each other. You would see to the best of our human ability, all uh, related party transactions are reconciled. Auditors are in paid exceedingly, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, financial dissection also only takes you so far. Uh, and right. we, we've seen that often you have to corroborate a lot of these disclosures through vendors, customers, non-conventional channels, 
Uh, I mean, I, I can see why you call it forensics now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> versus just research. Yeah, and, uh, and 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 it's interesting. I mean, I can discuss this this offline, but uh, we we we've, we've seen some very unquote quote quote unquote um, you know interesting bits of information through non-conventional channels that have helped us, you know, go through this minefield. Um, all said, after we've done all of that, even then, at a universe level, uh, there are certain metrics that we literally throw out of the window that a lot of people here, even in India, look at very closely. Book values, for instance. I mean, we would never, ever seriously uh, take any discussion that involves book value of a business. Well, for most Indian, Indian businesses, things like returns on invested capital, any metric that, that involves um, uh, an input from the balance sheet, I would say for most Indian companies, again, I'm, I wouldn't say all, for most Indian companies, uh, you know, I would not be engaging in a discussion based on these headline metrics. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's a strategy we've, uh, we've used for eight plus years. And there is a reason why we are at uh, that sort of a volatility level. Um, now, what is interesting is I might add that we are talking about India and I'm making people very skeptical, but the fact is, even in a market like even a market like that today, if you look at corporate governance when it comes to protection of minority interests, consistently rates above the likes of China and Korea, mm -hmm. which are above it in terms of weightage within MSCI EMs. So we're just inherently skeptical. I mean, we're not skeptical about India; we're generally skeptical. Well, I think another really compelling uh, feature of your fund is your track record. As you mentioned, you have an eight-year track record that's you've weathered some storms you've hung in there you're not somebody who's been just on the block for the past year or two or three you've been around for eight years so I think that's a really compelling point and I wonder you know I'm gonna this is sort of in conjunction with asking about your risk management but um, obviously like I said you've gone through some tough times and you're still here and um, so what do you attribute that to a uh, um, bunch of things uh, so specifically, if you're talking about risk management here, uh, before I talk about risk management, we need to draw some sort of perspective here. Now, we, 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 we focus on spaces that are where on pockets that are poor price discovery pockets. We invest in, in business within a landscape. If you look at BSE small cap in India, uh, more than half of all BSC small cap constituents today will have less than 10% institutional ownership. A lot of these names would be market leaders in niche spaces, but they will be inherently volatile because of those ownership patterns. So that's, that's one thing that we need to be very, very mindful of. Uh, so you create a philosophy, um, um, an investing framework that minimizes volatility at the outset, which is something that we've done past, past eight years. But when it comes to still managing risks, when it comes to managing exposures, for instance, uh, we have caps like we, we, no security will ever cross more than 20% of the book. No industry will ever cross more than 30% of the book, for instance. Um, but then there are certain other things that, again, uh, are, are based on conventional parameters sound very appealing and they might be so, but for a strategy like this, and especially for the space like we operate in, are probably not pertinent. So for instance, liquidity, right? Now, even if I look at my book today, I would say uh, a third of my book I can liquidate within a couple of days. Another third I can liquidate within four days. But there is a quarter of the book that might take up, take up to three weeks to liquidate. I'm obviously saying all of that assuming very, very low impact cost. Um, but the fact is, uh, liquidity is something that that you need to, I don't know, I don't have a better word for it, but let's, let's say compromise on, or you can always be an alpha hugger. And as I said, buy NASPERS, LG, Samsung, and Tata Motors of the world. Uh, that option is, is always there. So that's in terms of risk management. Um, in terms of our track record, obviously we've been through eight years, as you, as you mentioned, those eight years include two large rally years. We've had two, years of broad-based declines. We've got another few years of moderately high, uh, high markets. 
What is important and what is very critical for our investors to focus on is not only the fact that we've been there for eight years, the fact that we've consistently performed over this period. So this isn't a strategy that's up 40% one year down, 30% the next. Uh, we've, we've, we've done that for an extended period of time. And uh, we've, you know, this is our performance hasn't been skewed by one or two fantastic years. So we've not been, for lack of better word, lucky. We've, 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 we've minimized the, um, uh, the luck factor within this. Right, right. So what qualities or aspects of your operation, in your opinion, should help investors feel confident about allocating with you? I mean, you've mentioned a few already, but, you mm -hmm. know, um, sure, sure. in terms of trusting uh, placing a significant allocation with you, what would, what, what would be comforting? Yeah, that's 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 a very important question. And unfortunately, also a big challenge for for emerging managers that uh, that work with limited resources and whatever happened post two two thousand and eight has only ensured that allocators pays for right reasons have become more skeptical. The best we can do with our limited resources, we've done all of that. So when you mm -hmm. when you look at our administrators, uh, Apex is our administrator on the offshore uh -huh. side. Our, our accountants are Ernst and Young. So we've, we've, we've built a base of vendors that have been very solid support for us. And we, uh, we expect that to continue going forward. Um, we are in this sincerely um, and we are in this for long haul. We've been at it for eight years. Mm -hmm. A lot of people said that, you know, you cannot continue doing this, but, the, but there are things, and it's, it's hard to define passion, right? Uh, um, so our entire net worth, nearly our entire net worth is, is, is really invested in the same securities that we hold for our clients. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of a track record, I mean, as I said, you know, we've completely flipped the narrative that, uh, that small cap investing within India or elsewhere within emerging Asia needs to come with elevated volatility. We've completely mm -hmm. flipped that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So my last question is, how should investors think about India within the overall emerging markets basket? Well, that's, that's, that's a fantastic question and uh, something that uh, comes up in so many meetings that we have outside India, obviously. And when, when people are looking, looking at this very assorted set and trying to compare headline earnings between, let's say, India versus Brazil, blah, blah, blah. Well, firstly, India, as I said, is a very, very different market. You, you, you just look at market breadth and you would understand how different it is. As I said, we look more in terms of absolute valuation and, that's some, and, that's very, and it's very important to have a perspective around it. Um, so if you were to look at the entire EM basket and you were to look at the most comparable market in terms of um, growth, profitability, cash cycles, cash generation, uh, capital intensity, taxes, it will probably be South Africa. Uh, now, even a market like South Africa, primarily because of the growth differentials, if you were to build a giant DCF or let's say Nifty 50 versus GSC 40, you'll come to the same conclusion as we have. And we've done this several times. That India can always support a 40% premium over GSC 40. And it should for several right reasons. That's one. Two, when you're comparing these headline multiples, understand, and again, again, I'm talking here the Indian Nifty 50 benchmark that I have nothing to do with, but I'm just saying that because we are an Indian strategy, unfortunately, we get bucketed there and therefore in Nifty 50 pops up and you look at that and you look at MSCI EM and you make those comparisons, understand this, that even within Nifty 50, consumer staples and financials make almost 50% of the index. And most of the premium apples to apples versus global EMs really is there. Mm -hmm. Everywhere else one can argue, even though there might be premium, I would say premium should actually be larger. Uh, but you need to have that perspective. I think it is also important when you're comparing a market like India, again, headline multiples versus US, for instance, understand that US is one market which definitely compared to emerging markets stands out in these perennial restructuring charges taken off of reported earnings to show you operating earnings. So you might say S&P 500 today on this year's earnings is trading at about, let's say, 18 times. But on reported earnings, it's trading at 20 times. Mm -hmm. Nifty 50 trades ex-financials at about 21 times, including financials about 22 times. 
a nifty 50 x financials will report about 16 percent earnings growth uh, s p 500 would report five percent assuming you believe all of that on taken financials all 4q heavy mm -hmm. uh, but anyway the the, the point is uh, that because of lack of liquidity, um, f people take the convenient approach of, of comparing headline multiples, as I said, within a very assorted set that has very little in common uh, versus looking at businesses from, from an absolute point of view, the way we do. I think that's, that's, that's very, very important when you're comparing India versus uh, just about anybody else, EM mm -hmm. or otherwise. That's very interesting. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Piyush. I really enjoyed meeting you and learning about your investment program. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching this episode of Hedge Interview. You can find a summary of the show under show highlights on hedgeinterview.com. And feel free to share your comments or suggestions so that we can make Hedge Interview a valuable resource for fund managers and in, uh, institutional investors. Have a great day. Thank you so much.